seems to be underway has made us all perfectly certain about what is working in the March of Progress versus what is irrelevant to progress or even what is holding us back from further progress. Can we really monitor ourselves? Can we judge our own performance? Is it legitimate to have performance of development interventions judged jointly by funder and by implementer without having the opinion of anybody who's supposedly benefiting? Does any of us have the courage or the incentive, really, to go back and check whether something tried five or ten years ago is sustained and still producing good results, long after the funder and implementer may have left the scene? Now, we worry about these sorts of issues in global health, but arguably global health is the area of global development where these questions are the easiest to answer. Health outcomes, in many ways, are more quantifiable, sometimes even binary. I think this is much tougher in education and tougher still in terms of areas around policy advocacy. The river of information is flowing fast. And in our efforts to conduct monitoring and evaluation and learning, are we damming it up? Are we stepping into the right place in this river to see how cold and how fast and how deep it is? Or are we missing the mainstream and just wasting our time on the margins, paying attention to the wrong things? The aphorisms regarding data, monitoring, and measurement are legion. Uh, the most serious mistakes are not as a result of the wrong answers, they are as a result of the wrong questions, according to one of them. Or, randomized evaluation can be taught. It's not nuclear physics. Or, my current favorite, statistics are a crime. They must be investigated. So the idea behind this panel discussion is to try and explore and lift up to the light the strengths and weaknesses of our current monitoring and evaluation mindset, and to be candid about what seems to be working and what may not be, and to get some perspectives from practitioners, experts, victims of the data era in development. How do we know if the work we are doing is lifting barriers for girls and women? How do we know if we are strengthening or weakening civil society with our current measurement approaches? Let me invite my very learned and distinguished friends on the panel to come on out here and join me for this conversation. And I'll invite all of them to come out at once. So I will, you have their bios in your uh, program information, and I will introduce them to you as we go along, with your permission. And I'm going to start on my left here with um, Helga and Alex, two experts in the principles and practice of evaluation. Alex Eze, who is executive director of the African Population and Health Research Center and a recognized expert in the fields of population, health, and education in Africa. As I said, his full bio is in your program, but the most important excerpt from his bio, in my view, is this. Alex believes that African researchers and scientists can do more to improve life and well-being in Africa, that African scholars can produce excellent, globally respected, and locally <coughs> relevant research while based in Africa, and it does not take a whole lot to make a visible difference in Africa. Alex, welcome. Thank you, Carl. Um, next to Alex is Helga Fogstad, who is the head of global health research and education for the highly respected NORAD. Helga has spent much of her life in Africa and has been a leadership figure in the development of just about every significant agenda for progress on women's and children's health over the last decade. Helga, thank you for being here. 
Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So Alex, let me ask you first, um, to give us some perspective from Africa, where, as we know, many good development interventions are tried, and some work, um, some don't. What is the secret from your perspective in terms of good intervention design? What's the right place to start in designing an intervention? Uh, thanks, Carl. I think the best place to start is really from the point of view of the beneficiary. Many times we understand or we feel we understand what the issues are and what the solutions are from our perspective. But from the perspective of the person who is the beneficiary of that intervention, many times we might be actually missing the boat. And if we miss the boat in terms of the interventions, it does not matter how rigorous and how excellent our monitoring and evaluation systems are, we would not be speaking to the right things. I think it was the uh, Minister of Education in uh, South Sudan that once said, because we have so much need in South Sudan, everybody is pushing their own solutions down our throat without knowing what it is that we need. I can give you one specific example. You take a woman in the slums of Nairobi where we've done a lot of work, and we've shown that maternal mortality is at least 40% higher for women in slums of Nairobi than the national average. And the intervention that we could think of globally is let's give the women vouchers so when they're in labor, they can go to the health facility and deliver. And the poor woman can invest $2 that is more than what she makes in a day to buy the voucher. But 30, 40% of them might still stay with the voucher in their hands and give birth at home. When you go to her and ask, why, why did you buy the voucher and you didn't use it? And she turns around to you and says, where do you expect me to go at 2 o'clock in the morning when I'm in labor? Then you begin to see the irony of the interventions and the systems of measurement that we have in addressing her number one challenge. It's not that she didn't want to go to the health facility. So when you work with her to co-design the intervention that can respond to her own needs where she is, I think that's the time we begin to lift, uh, to lift the, in terms of making real progress. And we have shown that with very little interventions like that, working with the beneficiaries to understand where they are, we can make a huge difference. So you're talking really about human-centered design. Absolutely. Starting with the customer, the consumer, the beneficiary, listening to them, understanding their reality. That's essential to success in design. What about in evaluating down the road? What about iterating? How do you, you know, the design isn't always perfect, right? Yeah, well, when you think about the design, I think part of the challenge we have is, depending on the lens you are using to look at the evaluations, if you are the global community, I think we are making progress, and great progress in many ways. We can have many indicators. And you might even see the move from the MDGs to SDGs with from 60 to 230 indicators as part of that confidence that we are able to measure many things. And if you're a funder, you can also see we're making huge progress. We are having better push for accountability and for impact and for showing results. But if you're, at the, if you're a national leader, you step back and you look at what do I need? The national indicators are fine, but for my planning purposes and for my decision-making processes, I need data that is highly disaggregated, maybe at the sub-national level, by gender, by different other socioeconomic status that uh, generally we will not get in those indicators. And then you move in, as we get into Africa and look at uh, decentralization, if you take Kenya as, for example, we have 47 counties, and these are 47 centers where decisions are being made on a regular basis, where data needs are uh, critical, and yet we do not have the right data that we need to be able to make those process, uh, 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 decisions. So if I look at that, again, it would be what lens are we putting, uh, what light are we shining on that need? And we need to adapt our design and our evaluation strategies to respond to the basic question that is really the need for data, which is for planning purposes mm -hmm. at the level of uh, whether it's sub-national government or national government. I think no country and no program should be collecting data they do not need. 
Data needs to serve the needs of the people on the ground first and foremost. And then when we put in the systems that are there, the routine systems that generate this data, we strengthen them and build them rather than just creating more and more surveys focused on specific issues and disease uh, entities that we care about. The foundation has to be the national system and how do we strengthen it and make it robust enough to answer all the questions we have in monitoring the impact of our programs. Right. So Helga, you've spoken and written about this. I mean, we, we do generate huge quantities of data, maybe not always the right kind or at the right level, but as Alex points out, whose data is it? Uh, you've talked about uh, data in Africa as an extractive industry. Um, not much transformation and value added going on at the source, right? Not enough. Uh, tell us about that. Give us your perspective on that. Um, I must um, uh, share with you, Carl, that uh, having now been involved in other sectors, um, I've come aware of how data-driven the health sector really is compared to the other data, and, and also how occupied we have actually been in um, looking at the data, um, uh, revisiting the, uh, the use of it, and, and, and continuously trying an effort to improve it for various purposes. And I would like to um, really emphasize that with the global strategy of the UN Secretary General for Women's and, and, and Children's and Adolescents Health, um, the first strategy that was developed in 2010, there was a, there was a mutual realization that we needed not only a monitoring framework but an accountability framework and so uh, the commission for the UN commission on information and accountability was established and with it uh, came 10 key recommendations the one was what are we going to monitor for global purposes to actually um, hold each other accountable on and in order to assess how are we doing. And a lot of effort, the other nine um, uh, recommendations was about how to improve data. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there was a recommendation on uh, the establishment of CRVSs. There was a recommendation on strengthening district health information systems. Uh, there was a, a recommendation on uh, national health accounts. Uh, these were all uh, recommendations in order to improve mechanisms for data uh, collection and, and for fit for purpose in a way. I think uh, was, was also within the recommendation, and I just have to say that it was the uh, expert, uh, independent expert review uh, group, which was chaired by Richard Horton and Joy Pumapi, uh, that were delivered a report back to the UN Secretary Ger uh, General yearly reporting on progress. And, and there was somewhat a feeling now of, of mutual accountability uh, that um, is something that has developed and been harnessed. And I think we've come to not only uh, get more used to it, but appreciate it as a means to hold each other uh, actually accountable. With the new um, global strategy, uh, sec the second one that is much more in line with the, than the new SDGs, um, there is efforts now to develop a, a, what we call a common book of indicators. Uh, there's 60 indicators and there is something about agreeing on what they are, um, how they're going to be computed, how are they going to be registered, how they're going to be collected, who's going to compile it. So there is some effectiveness within this effort too. Um, there is 14 to 16 marker indicators that are going to then be used in order to test how we're actually doing uh, right. forward. And I think that's important. Um, likewise, there is an independent accountability panel. Um, and, uh, and this is something that's really important because it's not only about data being collected, used or not used, but there is something about how to use and how to use it forcefully for uh, cost-effective purposes for results. The, the new, um, the new uh, monitoring um, and accountability uh, framework focuses on results, resources, and rights. So looking at what our rights uh, 
uh, how is how do we um, how are we going to monitor uh, rights uh, aspects and further? So I think there has come a long way. Within this, uh, there is much more an approach of you know if health is going to be derived, 50% of health can, uh, outcomes are, are outside the health sector. We need to look at other sectors, and therefore we need to kind of agree on the monitoring of those marker indicators within the health, uh, uh, other sectors that are actually going are really crucial for health. So uh, there is. It, the focus on survive, thrive, and transform is important, uh, and also taking us then into fragile and humanitarian settings. So it is something about health now, not only collecting data and anal anal analyzing it for itself, but also uh, partnershiping with other sectors and looking at not in an exaggerated way, but it is a very concrete way on key markers that are really important for health. So, so a, a significant development of, a, of a, a, an infrastructure that's meant to oversee and to some degree govern standards in terms of data right. at the national level. And of course, your government has been significant in the development of the DHIS2 tool that NGOs use as well as governments. So it, I congratulate you for that, actually. Oh, the University of Oslo. It's well, okay, I'll give them credit, too. Thank you, University of Oslo. Um, but, but so there's a difference, it seems to me, between the data that we gather and collect for national-level decision-making and resource allocation purposes and sovereign purposes. And then at, at a lower level, the, decision, the decisions that get made about program design or program iteration or program change, course correction, as we collect data about what's working and what's not. Mm. Talk a little bit about the importance of failure. Mm. You know, we all know that there are things that fail in the things we are trying to accomplish. There are programs that don't achieve their success. How do we bake into this framework the, uh, an environment that welcomes and learns from failure? I think... Um, um on our, my, uh, on our part, uh, from Norway's side, but also from increasingly, not only uh, partner, um, various partners, but also uh, at, at um, administrative levels within, within all countries, there's become an increasing appreciation for implementation research, right. actually. And I think um, that will, as, as Alex has said, the combination of, of uh, programmers, uh, of policy makers and researchers is going to be really important in order to get to, uh, in, the, in that context, uh, the right questions uh, and the right, um, uh, the possibility of making uh, changes and improvements on the way no. instead of waiting five right. years down the line afterwards and, and right. so forth. Right. Alex, your perspective on failure. I think we need to do a lot more to reward failure than we do in the development field. Uh, the incentive structure and systems we work with actually makes it very difficult for people to acknowledge program failure. Right. We are an organization that also supports evaluation of, of programs that are implemented by other partners. And sometimes you go through a lot of hassle just trying to explain that this program just didn't work. We can go ahead and find why it didn't work. And that's as good an information and as anything else. What is the value of perpetuating a program that actually is not having any impact on the ground? But how many and yet we do how it all the time. We, we do, do it, it all, all the, the time, time because of the incentive systems that are right. there. We, if something didn't work, we actually, the organization that implemented it in sometimes might be in, in, in you know, in a difficult position. Uh, what do you do? This is a five-year program. You've gone into it two years, into it two and a half years, and you're realizing that there is no, uh, that that's, this is not working. Right. Now, what we might need to do is actually invest a bit more on process evaluation, particularly if it's going to be taken on by maybe a partner agency that's working with the implementer, so that we'll be able to know and generate the type of data that can inform program design as it is going on. And then at the end, if you do your impact evaluation, you have a more robust data system to draw on to understand what happened and why certain aspects of a program may not have worked. Mm -hmm. So I would say that one of the ways to enhance our ability to learn from failures in the field is to ensure that you know, 
organizations don't get penalized when they demonstrate that the programs that's been funded did not work. Yeah. It, it requires some organizational courage, though. Uh, we're going to come to our practitioners soon. Um, let me ask you a question about uh, randomized control trials. So as I said at the outset, I, th I think to some degree they've been demystified. Uh, um, uh, you know, they're not rocket science. Um, they are accessible. They're more widely used. Um, but they generate some controversy, too, uh, and they have limits. Give us your perspective on RCTs. They're very or, expensive. And they may be expensive, <laughs> yes. Okay, my perspective, which is mine and my alone, is um, I think you need RCTs for some things. There are many things that we deal with you really simply cannot randomize. There are many things that we know that work. And what we really know is to understand the implementation of them in a given context to make them work better. For things where there are lack of evidence on what would be the best strategies to implement this, then a randomized control trial will become very handy in looking at those. But the challenge we have with randomized control trial is when we <coughs> demonstrate that this can work within a certain set of uh, uh, boundaries that we've uh, defined and used for the implementation, taking that to scale becomes a completely different question and discussion altogether. How do you replicate those conditions in the natural context of a country or a district when you want to scale up? So, and we have demonstrated that a lot of things that have worked at the proof of concept stage through randomized control trials, taking them to scale, we don't achieve the same outcomes and the same impact as we expected because we are dealing with human beings and we are different and we are, the context is different and the implementers are different. And so, in a way, it's to recognize the limitations that it has, that is not everything that we can randomize. And even though for certain things, yes, it's a good science, it's a gold standard for some aspects of the work, but not for everything. And we need to <clears throat> balance a set of strategies that we use in evaluation that is not just uh, 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 a randomized control trial mm -hmm. and impact. There are a lot of, it, it's a spectrum yeah. of, uh, of methodologies that we need to apply to understand uh, outcomes in a given context. Helga, le let me ask you about evaluation, um, internal evaluation and external evaluation. Uh, is there a role for both? Is one superior to the other? What's your perspective on that? I think there is definitely a role for both. I think both are important, um, not the least to um, take the independent uh, external evaluations recommendations and assess them, internalize them, and keep uh, an internal check on them. Um, I think um, I, th I think there are more partners that are becoming bolder and at midterm reviews or, or even uh, and admitting failures. Earlier. And, yeah. yeah. Um, and and um, well, uh, I'm not sure. You know, they, they just don't yield those uh, the results that are expected. Right. Uh, and because of measures and because of internal evaluations, actually, right. we've been able to stop them. If we hadn't got those, it would have been more difficult to cap can capture them and be bolder right. in making decisions. But right. I, I must say, I, I do see that around the place much more now. You mentioned. Um, earlier the, the challenges around data and measurement and evaluation and uh, the, the challenge just in general in fragile environments, mm -hmm. which as we know are increasingly significant chunks of real estate in the world and leading to misery on a vast scale. What can we do about fragile environments and data? Well, I think the um, every woman everywhere is looking at uh, a monitoring framework and, and, and uh, I think uh, it will be important to there too agree on how to collect, where to collect, who collects, who compiles for various purposes. I, I think that there is a, an effort and, and there isn't an importance to that. Alex, um, RCTs as the gold standard you mentioned been around for a while now. Mm. Is there a new, is there something coming down the pike? Is there a new wave in monitoring and evaluation that you think is going to define the next 10 years of this work? Uh, I think there's I mean, a number of things uh, people are currently doing. Um, and again, depending on what the 
outcome it is that one is looking at. Um, I don't believe that uh, randomized control trial will go away uh, tomorrow. I think it is there for certain purposes. Um, when you look at impact evaluation, actually, it's looking more at the outcomes and, and uh, uh, there. But increasingly, a lot of people are looking to understand the processes. If we want to understand how things are working, not uh, what we have achieved, then it changes the discourse. And there's quite a lot of emphasis in really understanding from the point of view of the beneficiaries, what are they seeing. In my, what some of my colleagues recently are using um, photo voices to let people in the community to just tell a story about women and work. Uh, you have a woman that, you know, two weeks after delivery, they are forced to go back to their work and leave their baby, sometimes in child care. How are they being taken care of? And you have community members that are actually going around telling you stories you wouldn't have gotten otherwise through your uh, highly technical right. evaluation systems. And you are learning a lot from those engagements and things like that. So there are new things that are being tried out in the field that can help us understand how to adjust programs and make them achieve the intended outcomes that we, we need to have. Giving some human texture, some individual Absolutely. texture to the data, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you, Alex and Helga, but don't go anywhere. So <laughs> now I want to thank you for your patience, my friends here. We're going to reflect on some of these issues, but from the perspective of those perhaps a little bit more in contact with the marketplace or um, as implementers. And let me uh, introduce them. I will start from my far right. We have uh, Jakob Ries from Novo Nordisk, who's been there for 20 years with increasing levels of responsibility, critically now as uh, uh, Executive Vice President for Marketing, as well as responsibility for China and the Pacific regions, small parts of the world. Um, as a publicly traded pharmaceutical giant, of course, Novo Nordisk has immediate feedback from its shareholders and from the marketplace about whether things are working from their perspective. But balancing shareholder value and long-term health impact at the base of the emerging market pyramid, that's an interesting challenge. So I know we'll talk about that. Next to uh, Jakob is Nachilala Nkombo from the One Campaign in Africa. One, as we know, is a global anti-poverty effort that focuses in particular on Africa and plays a significant role in leading and coordinating advocacy efforts around poverty alleviation. And measuring, as we talked about, measuring the success of advocacy efforts and attribution for advocacy efforts is a tricky business. But no one is more committed to this than one. Um, next to her is um, Andrea Young from Grameen America. Uh, Grameen is perhaps the brand most identified with social enterprise in the development space. But um, Andrea's focus on the US, I think, is very important because it reminds us that it's a mistake to think about this topic only in the North-South context. This is very legitimately and genuinely an issue in the United States and in developed markets as well, or more developed markets. As somebody pointed out to me yesterday, every place is developing <laughs> in one way or another. It's a mistake to draw that dichotomy. And then last but not least, Regina Tamas from the Information Group on Reproductive Choice in Mexico. With her background in law and rights at the Inter-American Human Rights Commission and the Center for Reproductive Rights, Regina understands the challenges of measuring progress on policy and women's rights from the advocate's perspective, one woman at a time. Mexico City's significant achievement in making abortion safer is still an outlier, both within Mexico and in the region as a whole. And the advocate's insights into what works to inspire change and what may not work is important. So I want to start with you, Nachilala. We've mentioned it several times already, but one of the great challenges associated with the hard work of policy advocacy is measuring impact um, or, and or attributing impact. So talk about some of the examples that you have from the one perspective in attributing impact for your policy advocacy work in Africa. 
Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, it's a real pleasure and honor for me to be back at Women Deliver after the last Women Deliver conference in Kuala Lumpur. Yes, indeed, uh, you've put the, the big question um, in the room that I'll answer from the one's point of view, and I'm sure many other advocates do have the same experience. I just want to underline that as an anti-poverty fighting organization, our work is solely focused on convincing decision makers, policy makers, to make policy changes, to make public investments, and maybe some structural changes that are important for the poor. And we know that in the field that we work, and we, we, we actually make sure that uh, evaluation of our work begins at the very beginning when we are planning our activities. But we make sure that we are very hard on ourselves in terms of determining and refining met the metrics of success. And so um, I guess you're just wondering, how then is this advocacy me uh, measured? I think we, we measure influence. We measure the extent to which the activities uh, that we implement are actually are generating influence uh, uh, in the decisions of our targeted uh, policy makers. And we do that by uh, usually targeting specific, maybe global or national key decision-making moments that we feel we can leverage to make sure that resources are set aside and decisions are made that benefit, um, benefit the poor. Also, we have a very rigorous internal mecha uh, monitoring mechanism that helps us ensure that as we go along, we know what difference or impact or influence our activities are generating. The second level of influence that we measure is the extent to which our engagements, our campaigning assets are actually changing the terms of the debate with the public. We know that if we go alone with our data to policymakers without enough public support and public awareness around an issue that we're working on. We, you know, we don't have as much political clout because the advocacy business is a political business. So um, in terms of an example, last year uh, we embarked on a campaign, uh, a multi-year campaign that's focused on calling on governments globally um, and in Africa to increase the investments in women and girls. So the campaign is called Poverty is Sexist. We launched it last year for three reasons. Third, first reason, the global uh, international development community was, attempt, uh, was adopting new goals. We thought it was important to bring the firepower of one to sort of raise the stakes in terms of the importance of investing in women and girls uh, within the new set of goals. And then secondly, last year, uh, um, led by uh, Dr. Dlamini Zuma, the African Union declared 2015 as a year of women's empowerment and, 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 and development. And so for, as one, it was important to ensure that the decisions that were coming out of the Heads of State Summit in Johannesburg were actually making serious commitments about the issues and about the barriers that women in Africa are facing. And thirdly, and not lastly, we actually leveraged on the, on the fact that uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel in Germany was uh, leading the G7 and, and, and she was hosting the G7 just right before the the UN, uh, UN General Assembly. So I think the, the, sh sort of the short story of that is that uh, we, we, we feel uh, quite happy with uh, the results of, of our advocacy in the sense that uh, there were a number of decisions that African heads of states actually did make during their summit in Johannesburg. Some of them include commitments to provide more resources for women in agriculture, to invest more in education, the sort of things that we're talking about here. But also in the advocacy business, we know that you, you win some and you lose some, right. right? So some of the issues that we were pushing there included dealing with the issue of uh, uh, disability inequality and how that affects women. We didn't get that into the declaration. We also lost out on uh, uh, what we're calling for in terms of ensuring that innovation and technology is scaled up so that women, especially in rural areas, have better access to you know, agriculture services and, and health services. We didn't win that. But one thing we know for sure in terms of our advocacy work is that we have to be persistent, right? We use our staff, our members, our partners with everything they have from data to poetry to song 
to make a point about why an issue is particularly important. And we're very tough on ourselves and uh, as we are implementing campaigns, on a rolling basis, we ask ourselves, is this video generating the influence we're looking for? Mm -hmm. Are we getting the attention of the policymakers that we wanted to get attention? And if we don't, then we have to change uh, 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 calls. Um, and then, um, so this, this is a new uh, campaign, which is committing the organization overall in our fight against poverty to make sure that um, uh, uh, the work on gender is not a sideshow, but it's completely mainstream in terms of the campaigns and advocacy that we run sort of going forward. In terms of uh, uh, our other previous work, we've worked very vigorously since 2002 on the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. Uh, and again, our work there has been focused on ensuring that in different um, donor markets that one exists, the United States, the United Kingdom, right. Germany, France, and, and Belgium, we're engaging political decision makers there to put aside specific money towards the Global fun and we use uh, different kinds of tactics including uh, promoting the rest to the top right to provide leadership um, on the on these particular issues and again within that the way we've evaluated ourselves is making sure that we don't wait until the end to check how we are doing because each market has different challenges and, we, and each, each market has different opportunities in terms of having uh, a political impact. The other element I was wanted to mention is that in terms of um, impact at the community level, we depend a lot on our partners. We depend on the data that's collected by the Global Fund Secretariat, for example, to be able to tell the story that these programs do actually work to the policymakers and to the taxpayers in, in, in the Western world. And lastly, but not the least, I just wanted to mention that a, a second sort of a third layer of the work that we do is that we organize trips to the field to hear firsthand from the partners that we have, recipients of this money, to get an understanding of the difference that this has made. And I'll just illustrate one example of a trip, of two trips that our founder, Bono, made um, in Rwanda. Rwanda was one of the many African countries that was ravaged by the HIV crisis. When he visited Rwanda 10 years ago uh, and met this woman who was in charge, his sister who was in charge of this hospital, you know, they just held each other and cried because there were so many people that were dying needlessly because they didn't have access to ARVs. Right. This last year, he made the same trip to Rwanda, and they were crying tears of joy. They were crying tears of joy because there were so many millions of Rwandans that now have access to this treatment. The hospitals are better equipped. And so for me, that's the sort of difference uh, that... Uh, now, advocacy work uh, has, but obviously we know that we are in a field, we are in a movement where there are so many players. And so when we determine our return on investment, or our impact, we are very modest mm -hmm. in attributing maybe 10% of the bigger results in terms of the global fund replenishment or maybe an AU result to the work that we do because we know that with our partners, with other folks that uh, the collective brings, we probably would not get the level of influence that we do get. Right, so some interesting parallels here because you talk about the importance through things like like the trips yeah. of putting a human face on the recipient, on the beneficiary, and how that can humanize the data, mm -hmm. right? But also, you know, Alex pointed out the, from his perspective, the importance of designing interventions right from the base to begin with. I wonder, so when, when at, at the one, you know, command center, when you sit around and debate which policy advocacy issues to pursue for 2015 or 2016, how do you go about that, besides your own instincts, how do you get the input from the base about what the right advocacy priorities are? Right. Well, uh, we usually are guided by a five-year, four-year strategic plan. And when that is developed, there's a lot of consultation that goes in there, not only from our board who are knowledgeable and follow these issues, but also from partners on the ground in Africa. We also have an Africa Policy Advisory Board that gives us uh, pers our pers perspectives on what issues, poverty-related issues, will be um, uh, important to focus on. But from a point of view of one, I should say that uh, the data challenges at the national level undermine uh, you know, the strength of us making a case. Because if you want to campaign for a particular action, right, in terms of, say, supporting women's empowerment, we need updated information on women's property rights, for example. Sure. We need updated information about women's access to loans. Sure. But sometimes that information, um, that information is not there. So in terms of program design, we 
we usually run what we call um, an annual data report that takes stock of where different countries are in terms of their own commitments to their development, but also tracking how donors are doing on their commitments to development, whether it's health, whether it's nutrition, okay. um, or agriculture. And a lot of that um, helps us as well to get a better sense of what we should be focusing on. But because our work on the ground relies a lot on partners, we need to sort of create better feedback mechanisms to make sure that uh, what we end up doing may even challenge us as staff and even challenge the board members in terms of what they think is priority. Right. right. Jakob, uh, the market is an immediate and an insistent sort of factor in the life of a company like Novo Nordisk, um, a public company. I mean, I don't know what it's like in Denmark. Maybe it's less the case in Denmark than in New York, but the pressure for quarterly results is intense, right? And the marketplace is sort of in your face on a daily basis. Uh, you're under rigorous pressure for performance, one has to assume. But that obviously can complicate the life of a company that is trying to do good as well as do well trying to meet the needs at the base of the pyramid as well as meet your shareholder needs. Novo is, for example, active in fighting, among other things you do, in fighting gestational diabetes in, in Central America. I know because we do work with you there, yeah. and you work with many others. But sustaining that sort of work is a challenge. So talk to us about the trade-offs inherent in the shareholder-stakeholder uh, yeah. tension. Good. So, so, um, so when you talk about the the, uh, the stock market and and gestational diabetes in Nicaragua, I mean, there's there's a bit of a distance, but we can maybe help the problem a little bit by saying, uh, true, we're publicly traded, and yes, we're being quizzed and questioned at every quarterly result. But that's not how we manage the company. I mean, the stock market is something that we need to inform, uh, but we don't navigate through that. Uh, we have a much longer horizon, and you need to have that. So. Um, so in, in, in Novo Nordisk, uh, you know, we've been in diabetes for more than 90 years. Uh, what gets myself and my more than 40,000 colleagues to work every day is not to make money or please the stock market. That is to, to drive change that will defeat diabetes uh, ultimately, hopefully. That's the motivation and that's the aim. So very quickly, when you start thinking long term, you need to start thinking about sustainability. You need to both manage what you can monitor right now, but you cannot make the mistake of only defining the business as to what, what, is, 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 uh, what you're able to monitor and manage right now. You also need to broaden it out and look at the longer horizon. That's when we begin to look at the big, big unmet needs. Um, so you could say uh, in diabetes, I mean, it's so largely underserved. And, and at a conference like this, it's, it's, it's worth noting that that also, unfortunately, uh, hurts women more than men. Uh, they have tended to be uh, more obese, suffer more late complications and so forth. So, in our effort to solve diabetes in the long run, there is, uh, there is a contribution to some of the sustainable development goals. There is a long-term sustainable business in it for us. Uh, and it's, it's a very motivational mission to be on, on as a company. Uh, then I would like to make maybe one more remark, because then you talk about gestational diabetes, you could say, okay, that's a very special uh, uh, issue, and, and, um, and, and now we're back to a little bit the balance between having the big agenda with 420 million suffering from diabetes today going to 640 over the next years. We need to make a dent in that. So we need some, right. some big goals, mm -hmm. and we need to monitor whether we're tracking towards those. But we also need to look at where there are pockets where we can have a much more immediate impact. Uh, and, and in this case, uh, uh, we're now in Nicaragua, inspired by work in Colombia. We, we saw that, that only 5% of the Perkin women got tested for whether they had elevated blood glucose. And uh, through a joint project and uh, working uh, here with the World Diabetes Foundation again, uh, we're able to bring that number now to 97%. So now virtually all women get tested for elevated blood glucose, which means they can hopefully carry through and deliver a baby that is healthy and will not have these uh, multi, uh, multiple times higher uh, probability of also uh, developing diabetes. So that's an example of some, you know, going in specifically on the ground, doing something that we can then tangibly measure over a short period of time will really make a difference. 
And I think running a, a company like ours, you, you need that mix and that balance. Right. But going back to where I started, it, we don't take that from the stock market. I think that wouldn't lead us to the right places. And I don't want to caricature it for you, so yeah, apologies. Yeah. <laughs> but so, so, I mean, maybe it would have been the case, but if, if there had been a Women Deliver 20 years ago, I don't know if Novo Nordisk would have been here on the panel. Um, I, I hope they would have, but maybe not. I think the, the, converse, the whole conversation around uh, shared value, around public-private partnerships, has evolved quite a lot in the yeah. last 20 years. Give us your perspective on that. I think you were in New York recently for the Shared Value Summit, right? Yeah, it, you know, I, I, I hope we would have been here, and I think we, we, and I typically say, I'm not saying we were early movers in this field just because I think we saw things others didn't. It is, it is very closely connected to the fact when you work in diabetes, you have long time horizons, and you're basically servicing on commercial terms a, pr a, a big problem for society. Mm -hmm. If you want to be successful in the long run, you need to think shared value. We, we were thinking shared value before the, the, the phrase was coined. Mm -hmm. um, so, and where we're moving now is, you could say, where we are today, a standard sort of example of shared value is that we uh, undertake a lot of educational activities to also educate primary care not on our products, but generally on diabetes, because if they're not educated, they won't detect diabetes, they won't treat it early en uh, enough, and that's, of course, of great value to uh, wherever we undertake these uh, educational activities, but it's, of course, also value to us, because without any understanding of diabetes or uh, the will to prescribe the necessary medication, there is no market for us. So that's why we are today. That's a classic example of shared value today. You could say why I think we will be moving is to take that even further and say, our model is very much around you know, delivering boxes of medication and then uh, getting uh, uh, something in return, monetary return for that. I think as we move along, it will more and more be dependent on the, the results we're actually delivering. Right. Not through RCTs, but through real world evidence right. and basically having some kind of premium when we're following through and the patients get to, right. to, to proper control, that will uh, hopefully reward us more because that will bring our model into really pursuing shared value other than just documenting it. Right, so just pause for a second on that. What does success look like from the perspective of different shareholders 10 years from now for Novo Nordisk? Stakeholders, I should say. Uh, different stakeholders, but I think it, it uh, yeah, success would be, uh, first of all, we, 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 we need to have shown that we're beginning to make a dent in the problem with diabetes because that is still growing much faster so than grow, we, we are. A, a declining or stabilizing number of people. Exactly. In the world. We, we've, you know, through smarter urban environments, we're stopping some of the recruitment that comes through the wrong lifestyles for more than half of the population that lives there. I hope, I mean, that, uh, for instance, gestational diabetes is something that I think we can do a lot about and solve and beginning to have screening as a as standard everywhere in the world. Right. I would love to see that, for instance, no child with type 1 diabetes should not have access to insulin. I think that that is also something we can fix. But you could say, also to be realistic, we will still battle with diabetes because a lot of what is ongoing now will still turn into uh, full-blown type 2 diabetes at that point in time. But hopefully the medication will be so effective that we can actually have people live lives with too, without too much hassle and live a life without the devastating late complications. So I think we'll, we'll, we've come far uh, uh, at that point in time, but that's, that's of course what, what one needs to believe in when you have uh, big problems ahead of you. You need to be ambitious. <laughs> Andrea, uh, as I mentioned, Grameen, I think, is synonymous with social business and sustainability in our space. And so you're, you're bottom line focused, but your mission is about lifting lives. How do you strike that balance? Carl, well, first of all, it's, it's great to be here, and it is very interesting to have a lens as a practitioner balancing both uh, profitability in a social way, so every dollar of profit goes back into the program, but also uh, the important mission and where data has come into play. Just, just a quick context in working primarily and, and solely right now in the United States, the data-rich nation that we are, you know, the case for change is data-rich. So, you know, we're in the financial mm. inclusion space. Mm. One out of three women is living at or below the poverty line in the United States. 50% of single female-headed households in the United States are unbanked, a pretty staggering and unacceptable number in a developed nation. And if you look at the formal financial lending uh, landscape, $1 out of $23 
it's pretty amazing, is, is given to a woman in the formal financial lending space in the US. So you say to yourself, the case for change, there's plenty of data, now what? Uh, as a, a nonprofit organization that was replicated after the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, um, so I think incredible that a powerful solution in the poorest nation on earth has been able to translate itself all the way into Queens, New York, mm -hmm. in the richest nation, the richest city, and actually have impact. How, how do we balance sustainability um, and mission, and how does data play its role? Uh, I just would say that the organization is eight, eight years now in its making, and the, the beginning was really about, I'll just call it outputs. Um, and as a sustainable organization, measuring and getting to scale is critical, that without scale, you can't get to sustainability. Uh, and so right. starting from you know, one branch and 4,000 members today, we have 70,000 women uh, and their families who've been impacted in the United States in 11 cities. And we measured, so the original outputs that we measured ourselves internally were how many members do we have, uh, how much loan capital have we given out, that number is now almost $450 million. And then very important, as a sustainable organization, again, replicated after the Grameen Bank, what is the repayment rate? Can we sustain ourselves? And uh, it is remarkably 99.6%, so nearly 100%, so of that $450 million, all but a very tiny amount has been incredibly repaid by these 70,000 women, you know, and that's no different in East LA than it is in Austin, Texas, than it is in Harlem, uh, in New York. And so those were or critical. Or in DACA, or in DACA for that matter. Or right? in DACA, uh, very similar. So that was uh, obviously the extraordinary uh, impact of the Grameen Bank uh, and the Nobel Prize one on the fact that yep. the counterintuitive thought that the most at-risk population no collateral on these loans, uh, would be the highest risk for payback. And in fact, the opposite was true, that the loyalty, the gratitude of women to be able to get financial inclusion and access to loan capital was and continues to be and is true in the United States as the number one reason that the repayment rate is high. So as a sustainable organization, and I think as of last month, the t entire operations was more, is almost 50% covered by the interest income from the program, so we're at about 50% sustainability, which is unique. Uh, at the same time, the mission is quite important. And so a few years into it, not only did we measure internally our own outputs, but we moved into outcomes. And that was an interesting process, and we had partners and technology necessary to help us do that. But examples would be not just how many women do we give loans to and how much do they pay them back, but what's the income boost on a loan? Uh, she gets an, a first-time loan of $1,500 in the United States, has to use it to fuel her entrepreneurial business, but what's the impact for her? If she is at $15,000 household income, for a family of four, which defines her well below the poverty level in the United States, what is that income? Is it 17,000 after how long? Six months, one year? So number one was income boost. Number two was, you know, does she employ somebody else? Besides the self-employment she creates or gets from that access to loan capital, is she creating a job? Uh, and interestingly, the data, when we originally asked that answer, you know, was, uh, the question was, you know, how many people work for you? And the answer was often two, three, but those were not employed. They were family members, they were sons. So until we switch the very simple question to how many people do you pay? Oh. Mm. Okay, it's just being a pragmatic yeah. thing here. It's that, all about that, the right question, right? Yeah, good question. Had to be asked the right way from a data point of view because we're collecting that information from, yeah. you know, close to 70,000 women. So that's a metric that began to change. We needed oh. partnerships because we measure credit scores. Unlike the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, one very critical thing in the United States is the ability to have a credit score. That allows you, not just in terms of your rent, your phone bill, I mean, really to exist at every level, from low income to high income, it's an important score. We are not gonna measure that ourselves, so we had to partner with the three major credit institutions in the United States to begin to collect that data. And then the question was, how often do we collect that data? every six months or every year to make it usable and to be able to measure that on, in, in our case, 
thousands. Um, and then just to the point we were talking about before, we have that information weekly all the way to we are the only microfinance organization in the United States doing a randomized control trial. Uh -huh. So we do have an RCT, absolutely from a practitioner's point of view, very complicated, controversial, complex, but incredibly important to have the data of what microfinance and small loans to low-income entrepreneurs does in the United States of America to help poverty alleviation and all the other integrated impacts. Um, but that's going to take eight years. So a lot of money, an extraordinarily uh, generous and visionary uh, group uh, who is funding that. But at the same time, if we were not to do that, I'll say daily and weekly monitoring and data collection ourselves, it, we couldn't just You live. can't wait. You I can't cannot wait. wait until yeah. 2021 to understand the impact right. of <laughs> microfinance in the United States. So it is an, an interesting blend. So I, I stand by what my colleagues say that you need both if you have the ability to have it because it is expensive and it is long term. Uh, but there's no question. You know, we make decisions. Are, it's hard because we are um, a hybrid. We're a social <laughs> entrepreneurship. Uh, so what's failure? We've had really fascinating discussions, Carl, about failure. So I would just say as a business person who spent a career in for-profit, moving over to the NGO side, we've actually closed an operation. Um, and that was an interesting one because there's no question that that same repayment rate was very good. We didn't meet the number of women we thought or get the loan portfolio. And so we've actually had to make a business decision mm. based on data that not that it was a failure, but that in order to really be able to prioritize resources to open up in another city where we could reach and impact more women and really actually get to 10% of women in poverty in locale, you know, X, that it would be better suited to move or close. Um, and, and again, trying to manage that message because you have donors and people involved and every woman that we serve with alone has great impact and is not a failure by any stretch of the imagination. So it is, right. it's been, an, an, I would call it a constructive tension right. that we have to do both, that our, our mission is important, which is as simple as poverty alleviation through financial inclusion, which is alarmingly not accessible, especially since 2008 and 9, to low-income women in the United States, and is this group knows better, is, is the only economic engine in my mind that's going to get America back up on its feet and yet, we've got to use data and sustainability to get the kind of scale we need to, to do this. It's a big challenge. I mean, if I were tweeting, by the way, the $1 out of 23 yeah, so in the formal lending going to women, I would have tweeted that one. <laughs> um, uh, what about challenges around the... So you're collecting a lot of data. And as yeah. you point out, the U.S. is a data-rich environment. They're, they're all those credit scores, that yes. the ability to collect huge amounts of data. What are the challenges around data ownership? Um, for you? Well, I mean, it, it, it's sort of staggering, but not unlike any other small organization when we started. I mean, there were pieces of paper um, from the <laughs> first 500 to the first 2,000 to the first 6,000 uh, members on everything from, you know, do they have a cell phone? Do they ha is it a smartphone or a cell phone? What is their income level, et cetera? And we were dealing with, you know, this as opposed to today, where technology itself has been critical. So we partnered with Apple, who's provided iPads to all, I mean, every single thing now has, is, is on um, digitized, uh, and importantly, you know, the frequency of it and, it's, and the scale of it is, would have been nearly impossible the way we were originally collecting it in the beginning. So the amount of data, the frequency of it, and our ability with technology to capture that when we have this huge group uh, in many, many different cities has been really important. Mm -hmm. And the second piece is we couldn't have done it without partners. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we alone as an organization didn't have the resources and or more importantly, the wherewithal to be able to, to mine it, to ask the very simple questions the right way. So the combination of you know, major foundations and or some of our financial institutions that fund us, uh, Treasury, I mean, so whether it's public or, or private, big partners who understood and were better off, had more experience in collecting data, were very, not only critical, uh, but helpful financially as well as skill set wise to help us as we got to scale. We wouldn't have been able to do without that.
an amazing, <coughs> amazing experiment. And yeah. you're just getting started, really. You're just getting started. Yeah, we're just getting started. And uh, as I said, I think the, the narrative and the importance in the US is, is critical. The number one question people say to me is, oh, does microfinance really work in the United States of America? I didn't really realize. I knew about it from Bangladesh or Africa. Didn't know that it was um, not only important, but such a critical uh, and scalable poverty alleviation tool. Right. Regina, in Mexico City, uh, reproductive choice and rights have had significant advances, uh, but progress certainly in the country is quite uneven, um, as in all of our countries for that matter, certainly in my country. Talk to us from your perspective about the challenges of aggregating individual rights advances, so the woman by woman that you as an advocate deal with, into a system changing whole? I mean, how do you go from individual to policy to, to the bigger picture? What's been the experience for you on that? Well, I think being a reproductive justice organization that does mostly legal work, um, we, we do focus on the person, and I think the woman is the one that decides how they want to frame the strategy. So if we, we do a lot of litigation, so I think that's a, that's a good example. When we, when we do litigate, we might think a strategy will not only help that woman, but also catalyze and bring changes for the whole country. And, and I think uh, that might not be the good start. I think the first thing is to talk to the woman and see what they want. So we do have cases which just um, have an impact for that specific woman. And we were just evaluating whether or not we won or lost the case. And I think we've now come to realize that the impact that that case has for that specific woman might also create uh, new opportunities for other in their families, in their community, and the state level. We've come to realize that the possibility of the woman becoming an advocate themselves has made um, huge changes that we were not measuring before, uh, that now has uh, created the possibility for her to also know the path for other women she might know in her own family or community uh, on how to defend her rights. So I think that's a specific case where we were evaluating maybe the wrong thing because we were thinking about whether winning or losing the case. And then there's other cases that have actually catalyzed changes in terms of legislation or public policy, which I think uh, are as important as any other case. Right. Uh, so I think one of the challenges that we face is that there's no recipe for cases. Right. Every single story is different. So we, we face the challenge of, of being able to move from one strategy to the other, even though the case might have the same facts. Uh, Many of the cases uh, might seem equal. Uh, a, a, a woman was denied access to legal abortion, although she was a survivor of rape and it's legal in the country. Right. So, but each different story has a different right. story. Right. So I think, uh, but we have been able to win cases and then those changes catalyzed uh, different um, policies and laws that have changed that do not impact specifically on that woman, but in the whole country. Yeah. Uh, but then to make it harder, I think sometimes we win the cases, we change the law, and for example, the, there's a constitutional challenge, right? So right when you think you've not only changed that woman's life and maybe uh, other women that be near her, uh, and you change actually the law, uh, that law is being uh, challenged by other groups that think uh, differently. Right. So I think right. uh, it's a constant way of, um, it's, a, it's very passionate and I do think you have to have a very clear objective and you have to do that through a very well uh, planning uh, and use all your resources, your passion, your uh, intelligence to achieve that objective. But you have to be uh, ready to, to be flexible because the context changes, the government changes, and each case is different. Um, so I think for advocacy, it's very important not only to measure the result, but the whole process mm -hmm. and each case uh, individually. Um, and and I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think you make an important point, which, or the, in, in terms of individual advocacy, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. In fact, you may be advancing the systemic cause even when you lose through 
increasing the number of people who are motivated and ad advocate to advocate around change or you know so it's not the win it's win lose is not necessarily the right mm -hmm. uh, success metric for you right mm -hmm. when you're talking about system change it is and I, even for litigation you might think I, I, I also think it depends who's measuring right if it's the beneficiaries which I think it's the most important if you have a human rights lens and a human rights approach to your work that should be the the thing that motivates you the most but it depends also if it's the donor if it's the government or is the staff themselves uh, I think there's a lot of, of things to analyze there on who's evaluating whether or not you're having success but I even think uh, to make it more complicated if you have um, litigation, like more cases are coming to your organization, does that really mean you're being more successful because more people know about your work? Or does it really mean that there's more human rights violations? Uh, there's always a side that you have to keep in mind uh, on whether or not you're being successful. And I think it's very important to be critical and also to learn, as it has, it has been said, about failures. Uh, my organization, together with a group of organizations, because I also think alliances are very important, you can just do this little by sure. litigation and changing law, then there's the implementation part as well. I think we, we spent uh, almost more 10 years, I would say, training uh, judges and prosecutors so that they would know what the law is around abortion for rape survivors. And we had very good results in terms of uh, uh, they increasing their knowledge on what the law is and the rights of the woman. And then after a 10-year evaluation, we realized that only 10% of the abortions due to, to rape had increased. So we, we switched to a, a more confrontational and radical mm. strategy where we are now litigating. And I don't know, but I, I think people are now scared, authorities, so they're more active, no? So mm. we wanted to do technical assistance and of course, we changed probably some some minds, but I think now with this radical and confrontational strategy, with the context in Mexico where human rights violations are very common yep. and discrimination is very common against women, um, I think this radical uh, strategy has helped more. We, then we have to evaluate that strategy yep. again in a couple of years. But uh, once you go I, radical, it may be hard to go back. Though. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> And I, I think um, asking, it's just not about winning or losing the case, but that case also, and in the process, you have to win that woman's trust, then you have to win the family's trust, no? and, and then you have to change the mindset of the judge or the prosecutor that really think they, this, these women deserve what happened to them because they are indigenous, because they don't speak uh, Spanish. Uh, so I think it's a whole process. Uh, and, and that's why I, I am always, uh, we're always striving to have conversations, for example, with donors. Yeah. I don't think the report format will, let, will, will transmit you, will let you transmit what you really go through when you just say, oh, we won or we did not win this case. Right. So I think that's right. crucial as well. So it's an interesting theme. I mean, we start from the macro issues here and, you know, you get right down to the individual in terms of litigation and that being the way, the, the way through which you, you tell your story, the individual story. And all of us wrestle with scale and certainly on policy issues. You know, you're talking about system level change, which we're aiming for, but it all starts with the individual at one level, the consumer, the sufferer, the what have you. So it's an interesting reminder. When, in your litigation, um, uh, how, how did you describe to a donor last year the impact you had through your litigation work? Um, I, I would say that uh, at first the clients are happy and, and I think that's very important in terms of um, making sure that through this process you are just doing what they really want. You might be there for assistance because you know the law better but you don't really know what they're aiming for and what their objective is. Um, and so um, we basically talk to them about the stories because mm -hmm. I think uh, 
we, we had a case where we were able to, for example, bring it to the Supreme Court, which is, uh, so we, we lost in the first instance, we lost in the second instance, but we were able to do something before the Supreme Court, so the report was fabulous at the timing, right? But then, a couple of uh, months later, the, the woman decided to withdraw from the case, mm -hmm. right? So I haven't sent the report to the, the owner yet. <laughs> but I, I think we won't the, tell. The, the story is, um, I, I think you have to be very flexible and be able, and I think that's an ability that you have to uh, develop with your team to also be able to adapt to the new circumstances mm. uh, and don't lose track of the objective because I do think you cannot just be spontaneous and passionate. I think objective, the objective being clearly defined through planning uh, and learning from the evaluation and the challenges, I think uh, it's crucial. Mm. I, I always... I think I suffer more when I have to to figure out what the indicators are because how do you put value to, I don't know, Romeo, which is a widower of a woman that died during childbirth in Chiapas because there were no doctors when she seek for the service. Or uh, how do you put value on Irma who went to seek out for, for services as well but was denied access to the clinic because she was indigenous and looked uh, like she didn't need the services. So, right. so I think uh, also making sure that you have the right indicators is, is, is important so that you can actually learn from the evaluation that you're doing. And, and we, I think also we have to learn on to adapt but also to push yourself to do new things. And I think risks are sometimes difficult to take but I think it, they're worth taking uh, because uh, times are changing and risks are worth it. Uh, and you might just feel comfortable with doing what you've always been doing and uh, yet you know that you're good at. But sometimes evaluation uh, just uh, makes you realize that maybe you should be doing something else or add something else yeah. or work with someone else. Yeah. I think that's important. I think all of us are trying to, we're, we're all working for Romeo and Alma. We're all working for them. Although we also all, most, all of us, I think, have the ambition to reach so many of them at scale, as many as we possibly can, because we know the needs are individual and profound and all valuable. So in a moment, I'm going to ask our uh, final speaker to come out and give us the final word or some final thoughts. But before I do that, let me just ask each of you to answer a question about so remember, the context is um, how do we know how we are doing, and specifically in terms of lifting girls and women and delivering for good. Um, so from your perspective, what does success look like in answering that question? How do we know what we are doing? We will be successful when what, Alex? Um, I believe we will be successful when every indicator that we need to look at, we can get it through the national routine systems that's highly disaggregated by gender, then we will be able to know indeed whether we are making a difference in their lives. So we'll have national systems that will allow us to understand exactly the impact of what we're doing. Helga, what does success I, look like? Um, I think success looks like an agreed set of um, <clears throat> global indicators that we can um, commit to um, and hold our, each other accountable for. Uh, I think, um, I mean, uh, we've previously heard uh, during the sessions that um, there are countries where only 30% are registered. I mean, what, what gets counted uh, counts. counts. Uh, and so uh, I think uh, in intermediate uh, measures, we need surveys, we need estimates, they need to be robust enough in order to understand this. Now, <clears throat> having said that, I think that with data, uh, you have to have this human story. I mean, just the opening yesterday um, was so powerful because everybody told their single story and it would not have been as powerful if we had regurgitated <laughs> <laughs> the right. data and right. thrown each other with right. the data. So I think that it's a combination of, right. of data and stories. It's data and with, data with faces. Yeah. Mm. That's. Jakob, 
How do we know what we are doing? What does success look like from the perspective of Novo Nordisk? Oh, I was way into gestational diabetes here, not Novo Nordisk. So, because uh, I think in, uh, if you allow me, we'll, we'll do fine in Novo Nordisk. I think the other agenda is more important. I would say uh, if we could get to a point where newborns have a better health starting point than their mothers did, I think uh, we will have come far because today it's actually worse than what the mother said, and I think that's uh, stepping in the wrong direction. So, um, so to me, that is that is uh, it's not solving the entire problem of diabetes, but it's attacking it at the very root cause. It's not a, an unrealistic target to have, and I think that would be uh, that would be nice to know that now the future generations are better off than than the previous. It's it's a great it's humble yet ambitious and important, and it's a reminder that in the area that you talk about, gestational diabetes, I mean, in contrast to so many other things in global health where actually progress is substantial, yeah. th this, where, this is a place where we're going backwards. So it's going backwards, uh, and, and yet again, FIGO issuing new uh, guidelines, so there are also, there's progress, but I think uh, that has to then come through into clinical practice and deliver the results, and, 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 and if I were to tie it back to Nordos, I would say, I mean, if that were to happen, th there would probably be a lot of other things that would, that would mean that a lot more uh, individuals would understand diabetes, the families would have a better understanding, the healthcare practitioners would have a broader understanding. And, you know, generally, if we do, uh, do change uh, diabetes for good, then, then, you know, we'll be fine. Yeah. Nachilala, what does success look like? Well, at one, we say poverty is sexist. And if that continues, then we know that we have failed. And for us to know that we're successful, it's important that every district and every town uh, can demonstrate what it's doing to invest in its women and girls. And we need data to back any claims. What we have now that is that even in sectors or countries where there is existing updated data, there are national averages. But we know the situation of women is different in different localities. So if we are, if we, for us to be able to say we're successful, we need to be able to say in this village in Tanzania, this is what the local government is doing and has done over the last five, 10 years. So disaggregation and- Yes, uh, at the very uh, mm. micro level. Mm. Um, that's first. And secondly, I think in terms of our fight against AIDS, uh, TB and malaria, I think w our goal is to work towards an AIDS-free generation. Uh, so far, the Global Fund has managed to put 17 million people on ARVs. We need to get to a point where everyone that needs ARVs has them. Right. right now, one of the challenges in the HIV advocacy community that we're facing is that 80% of the new infections are of young women of reproductive age. 80%. Right. We need to get that number to zero. Right. Andrea. Uh, success for us looks like Susanna. Uh, and I'll tell you her fast story, but I think it is where you've got this intersection between qualitative and quantitative. We've all been talking about it, and, and I think saying 70,000 doesn't mean anything, and just saying we ha we're helping one single person doesn't. So if you kind of blend them, she is a woman from Mexico, an immigrant before the wall from Mexico, <laughs> who landed in New wall, York though, City uh, without uh, <laughs> escaping from a violent relationship with a child of three months. She lived in the subway F train, if you know New York, for a week. A Grameen America, a loan officer, gave her a $1,500 loan. She rented a chair in a beauty salon in Queens. Mm -hmm. Today, she has paid back every loan up to $60,000 every single week. She has three employees. She just got an $11,000 loan because her track record was so good with which she's going to move into another salon, employ another few employees. Uh, and about a week ago, she got her United States citizenship and proudly told me that she is a new American ready to go out and vote. Oh. And so for that, that, that's success. That is success. Regina. I think uh, success would be when human rights do include a uh, gender perspective. And I think uh, when uh, um, states are accountable for human rights violations that happen to women in the sphere of the reproductive uh, health, I, I think also when women would actually be able to make decisions on their own bodies. And I think uh, 
working uh, with in a reproductive justice organization, it's really uh, terrifying to see that women that want to decide to terminate a pregnancy, their rights are violated. But those who actually want to have a baby, they suffer from obst obstetric violence when yeah. they're in, in their child do, uh, yeah. delivering. Or, or they might even die. So, they're, they're, uh, so there's no option. I think there's, uh, uh, there's still a lot of a long way to go th uh, in order for women to actually be respected uh, in terms of her decisions. I think it would represent a lot if states, instead of apologizing publicly for their human rights violations, they will actually act in order to prevent more violations right. to happen. So lots of things for us to work on. I know we are very close to the end. I'm going to invite my friend uh, Julia Bunting, OBE, the president of the Population Council, and formerly with IPPF, to come out and join us for some closing thoughts. Julia. Thank you, Carl, and thank you to all our panelists for a really great discussion this morning. In closing, I want to make just three points. So my first point is that, we, is that evidence, data, and statistics are critical. We need data to monitor development progress, but importantly, we need data to actually achieve development outcomes. If we don't know where people are, where the needs are the greatest, and what works best, then we won't know what to invest in or whether our efforts have even worked. We need to invest in building national and local capacity for collecting and, importantly, using data, statistics and evidence. As Melinda Gates said earlier, we need a data revolution. My second point is that evidence, not intuition, must guide global health and development efforts. At the dawn of the Sustainable Development Goals, the time for using data and evidence is now more than ever before. The SDGs are a bold ambition for development for the next 15 years. To deliver for everyone, to ensure that we leave no one behind, our investments need to be guided by evidence of what works. And my third point is that we need to be careful of the tyranny of the averages. To ensure that we leave no one behind, we must disaggregate data by age, by gender, by income, by location. Only then can we identify the hotspots and the clusters of people where the needs are greatest. If we don't know where or for whom the needs are greatest, then we won't be able to have the greatest impact with our investments. So my call to action for all of you today is to do it and do it now. We must collect and use data and evidence. There are no shortcuts. While the cost of investing in data and evidence is not insignificant, the cost of failing to invest in proven interventions and where the needs are greatest will impact our ability to achieve the SDGs, particularly for women and girls. As the mother of a 12-year-old girl, I would argue that our ability to use data to enable the 60 million 12-year-old girls around the world to make a healthy transition to adulthood will determine whether or not we actually achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. I'm reminded of the Chinese proverb, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, the second best time is today. Today and for the next 15 years, we need to ensure that policies and programs are guided by evidence and not intuition. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. And please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you all very much.